SnapDeck IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC, education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla, and I will be your host. And today we have our friend, once again, Carl Bickmore with Snap Tech IT. So hello, Carl. Well, hello, hello, Dana. How are you? Good, good. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about physical protection, something people, it's probably easier to wrap your head around, but sometimes people don't necessarily think about it all the time. So we're also going to talk about how it relates to CMMC. So what does CMMC physical protection domain require? Well, first of all, you know, this is an interesting topic. I think that it's actually one of the most obvious ones, but sometimes when we're thinking about cybersecurity, we forget that actually, you know, being able to get inside and out of your, out of your building is a requirement for the standard. Just like many of the standards are actually around policies and procedures, not even specifically technical, right? So CMMC has a lot of domains in it that, that make a lot of sense from a protection standpoint. And so, you know, the key thing is on the physical side, are you protecting your perimeter? And of course, a lot of the folks that we work with in the CMMC space also have regulation requirements. And so they have to follow the ITAR guidance. And so not only do you need to have your physical locations protected and uh, monitored and all the various things related to that, but you also need to verify the citizenship of everybody that comes in the door uh, in the process as well. Uh, and and uh, and so there's there's lots of different parts to it, but basically this is all about how do you make sure you know exactly who's in your building and that it is secure against people from wandering in. I I, I have to tell you I have had uh, more than one penetration test where the pen testers will try to physically gain access to a facility, and they get access more often than you might think by a helpful employee thinking they're doing the right thing, letting somebody in who is just not being straightforward. And fortunately, I'll just knock on wood, we haven't had an actual attacker come to one of our customers, but we have had several fail this process on a pen test. So, And, you know, I think that's something that it sounds obvious, right? But it's something to bring up to your customers to say, hey, listen, you know, make sure that people that are visiting, they have a visitor log. And especially for CMMC, that's going to take, you can't just show them like, oh, we started this yesterday. There's one person that's been here since then. You know, you have to show that you're actually monitoring who's coming in and out of the building. And you're right. Somebody might just be, oh, let me hold the door for you. They're carrying a lot of stuff. And, you know, people by nature want to be want to be helpful. So that, that's a very, very good point. Well, and they trust that people are being honest, too. And they say, oh, yeah, I'm here to deliver this or I'm doing this IT thing or whatever it may be. Um, I mean, I, last year we actually had uh, a customer uh, let somebody into one of their locations and let them plug in a computer device that could phone home. I mean, they, they got really far on that one before somebody said, hey, maybe this isn't the right thing. And yeah. so, the, I mean, which which goes to point out the other things that, that I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, we've mentioned it before, is end user awareness training is always helpful as well. But having clear and clean procedures. So it's not just, um, you know, that you lock your doors. It's that you have escorting procedures. Um, you have sign-in procedures and logs. It's that you ha are protecting your facilities your staff, your all your systems from physical access. Uh, the reality of it is, is if there's data on a computer and you can get physical access to it, so often with physical access, you can kind of blow right through whatever protections might be and gain access to data on the drives of those systems directly. And so there's just a lot that you need to do to make this happen. So audit logs, escorting, uh, checking citizenship, if that applies for the, the escort or the uh, export protections, um, and then just control and manage. And I'll, and I'll tell you another thing that we see on a regular basis is a lot of folks will leverage camera systems to help them with their perimeter security and their internal security, which is a great thing to do. In fact, a lot of times there's really specific requirements and I'll just lay them out. But one is that all forms of ingress, egress, in and out, need to have a camera on them. And then a shot of your wiring closets or IDF rooms or your server rooms uh, should be uh, protected by you know locks, controls, access control, logged access, so forth, so on. And one uh, one pro tip I'll give you, because I've seen this on more than one case, is folks have a DVR system, but they're not 
protect, particularly maintaining it well or checking it often. And sometimes the date and timestamp is wrong on those, and that's very problematic. Uh, you really want to be able to rely that when that video is recorded or when that access control system, if it's linked or, or ha has its time, that the date and time are checked and regularly known to be working and correct so that you can rely that if you need to look at an event that the date and time stamp on it is accurate. Uh, common That's mistake. A good point. That's a very good point about the date and the time. I would never have thought about that. Yeah. Well, it takes a few times having that situation where you look it up and says, oh yeah, there's no way that happened in 1900. Uh, so, or, or, you know, whatever the thing is, it's like, uh, reliability on the date and timestamp is helpful. Just just uh, keep that in mind when you're thinking about physical access. That makes sense. And then also, if you're going to put cameras up, make sure you change the default password settings that are in there. <laughs> yes, yes, hardening procedures still apply. People, you know, those IoT devices, they're, um, they're their own little beast, their own little risk point, right? They're, that you, It's a really great point. But here's the thing, just to remember, though, when it comes to CMMC, even level one, the most basic where, you know, you're just beginning the process of trying to have good hygiene, uh, you need to have the physical layer of protection in place. Um, and if you are scoping out certain systems to be um, uh, CUI accessible and certain systems or rooms to not be, you need to build that into your physical plan at your facility as well and have different access into areas where CUI data might be available on a PC. Or you could take the approach that your entire facility is that and, and then protect it as such. I've seen people wanting to scope it out sometimes and sometimes people say the whole facility. The whole facility is probably the best way to go when it comes to CMMC uh, because when you scope it out, you're really, um, you're really inviting people too far into your organization usually anyway, so. Okay, that's a good one. So they do have to pay attention to the lower levels as this question is. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, hey, look, a question. Yeah, you see, right <laughs> ahead of it. <laughs> So what are the four physical protection domain practices for level one? Well, so first you gotta limit physical access to organizational information systems, the equipment, respective operating environments to only authorized individuals. So, you know, you can have a server room, but, and it can have locks on it, but that, those locks are access control, badge cards, swipe entry, whatever it may be, need to be restricted only to authorized personnel. So it's not enough that they're a background checked employee of your organization, they need to be specifically authorized and you should always follow the practice of least privilege required. So really, you know, your IT people should be the only ones with access to that closet, for instance, or that server room. Uh, you need to escort and monitor visitors' activity, you know, badge them. A lot of folks have gotten some nice tablet systems where somebody can come in and sign in and they'll print out a badge that sticks on there with their picture on it. Those are pretty inexpensive ways of collecting visitor information, logging it, and, and making sure somebody has some type of visitor badge that's been signed in. And then anytime if your employees see somebody walking around with a badge that isn't escorted, they know exactly what to do. Or somebody they don't recognize without a badge, also unescorted, those are things to be looking out for. Uh, the, the third one is, uh, you know, you have to maintain the audit logs. You have to prove who went where and when of all the physical access. And then the fourth one, control and manage physical access devices in general. And so you need to be constantly auditing them, checking them that they're working and you need to have a management plan for that and identified who manages it and how the control is done. And that stuff takes time. So I, like we always try to state everybody, I know you gotta get ready for CMMC whenever, but the sooner you get started on implementing some of these things, the more history you're gonna have to show to an assessor when they do come in. And uh, like I said, you can't say, we started the visitor log yesterday and since then one person's been here, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, an empty visitor log or with a couple on it only uh, does strike itself as perhaps not a practice in place. Maybe just a brand new idea, right? Hey, and look, you got to start somewhere, but the sooner the better. Right? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. All right, so what is needed to comply with the physical protection domain controls for level three and up? Okay, so I think the, the biggest thing that you get by the time you get to level three is um, there's some telework strategies that you have to make sure are in place. Uh, for instance, uh, you need to have a verifiably secure telework strategy, meaning if for folks are gonna work on the road or remote, you need to be able to say that you have 100% control and visibility and restrictability of that endpoint, no matter where it is. Or So for instance, perhaps maybe you say, for instance, some people can work from home. You would need to control that home network environment as well as the computer inside of it. Uh, 
the, the, the term is a verifiably secure telework strategy. Um, all the normal things that you typically expect, endpoint, end, endpoint encryption, avoidance of public Wi-Fi, uh, the uh, multi-factor authentication or remote access, multi-factor authentication to get to data. Uh, perhaps you're using a, a Office 365, multi-factor authentication to that. Um, other things that are involved in um, you need to be using, for instance, if you're using Office 365, the conditional access that says you cannot log in or access data in this Office 365 unless you're coming from a known location, which is typically controlled by, say, your business works IP address. And so a VPN access is needed to connect in to then be able to access email, so forth. So, so there's additional steps you have to take uh, on the remote access and the telework strategy at level three that that becomes a requirement with additional controls that are added at that level. And then you can also set times, right? That people can log in, that only people can log in during this time. <laughs> this time. So that's another little helpful thing too, if you want to just keep everybody out on, I don't know, on the weekend or whatever. Yeah, I mean, once again, least privilege. And so if you know that they ne never have any business logging in between say 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, remotely, then restrict it, right? Anytime you can box it down to the least required, uh, that's that's the way to go. Uh, the um, the other things is you need to put in controls to make sure that you can prove that this hasn't been tampered with as well. And so level three, much of level three's addition uh, with a lot of new controls that get added at level three. The other main point of level three is now you're getting auditing and policy verification and regular management uh, verification and proof of non tampering. And so there's a lot of things that get added to the mix by the time you get to level three around um, proof of non-tampering, logging, auditing, so forth, so on. And so the remote access and the access in the building and all that all need to be tested on a regular basis. And you need to show that you have controls in place that are being followed and verified and audited. That's a good point about the non-tampering. Yeah. Prove that. That's, that's a very good point. So I never really, you know, thought about adding that to the end, but that makes sense. That does make well, sense. Well, so if a log can be audited, uh, you could throw shade on whether it's an effective log or not, right? You need to have a way of shipping it and moving it in a way that you can compare or prove that it has not been audited from original, you know, creation of that log, as an example. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right. So how do we safeguard alternate facilities, work from home, mobile devices, since we cannot control the physical access? Yeah, well, so the biggest thing is, I think if you, you need these things to be simple enough that they're actually usable, but also safe enough that they're going to meet the needs. And I think the biggest things to focus on is, look, authentication and how you're controlling that is the number one first step. Uh, encryption and having uh, that really buttoned down well is the second step. So when it comes to authentication, once again, really nothing should be accessible from a telework standpoint without multi-factor authentication and perhaps at multiple levels. Uh, and then, uh, you know, say VPN and email as an example, um, uh, or maybe VPN email and to uh, network shared drive. Um, the other thing that's coming out this next year, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, but the zero trust networking accesses or ZTNA as it's coming, as it's being said, is, is uh, coming on to the, to the scene and we're seeing lots of providers jumping on board. It, uh, you know, there's still work to do to make sure these things are, are FIPS compliant or DFARS compliant that you need to pay attention to as well. But as these things come on, that could actually make it easier for us to control the remote access um, and, and really restrict what people can do once they get, say, for instance, gain a VPN access or really VPN replacement access. But really, you know, identity management is very important and validation and verification, encryption of the device, making sure data is encrypted in transit and at receipt. Um, those are the really in important pieces on the telework strategy. Yeah, that, that sounds like that's going to be very helpful, that zero trust. And then you got to think about when we all got thrown home from the beginning when COVID hit and how uh, unsecure things probably were at that point versus where yeah. we are now, where we're really making strides, but we still have a ways to go. I mean, it was mayhem at first, right? I mean, some so many locations not uh, prepared. I can say, fortunately, we already had secure methodologies in place for our customers. It was just a matter of a whole bunch of people that had not previously used it before now needing to be shown how, okay, this is the application you click on. Here's how you go. Here's what the enrollment authentication looks like. And, and so, but, you know, a lot of folks just started providing pretty wide open remote access and added enormous amounts of risk and really non-compliance to their environment. And uh, if you haven't gone back and addressed that, well, it, now's the time. 
we're, we're far enough past this that there's just no reason to be operating in emergency mode like that. And frankly, if you get into emergency mode again, you probably still can do a better job if you were doing it without controls. It is possible, just you know, have the right team behind you. But yeah, it, it was a crazy time. I'm glad it's behind us that we're not dealing with that level of sudden need for remote access. Uh, and, and to be perfectly frank, there's more than one machine shop I've met that, or, or CMMC compliant organization that simply just doesn't do remote access because they want to, they want to avoid the potential issues with it, you know, and that can work too. If that works for your business, then that that's then do it. Um, the reality is most of us have at least some of our staff that remote access really needs to be part of the picture now. And finding your way through that from a compliance standpoint requires some rigor, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. And some people or some businesses may have decided that this may be the new model that they're going to use. They're not going to pay rent. They're not going to have to require everybody to come to a physical building. You know, people can work from home and, you know, which opens up a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, it opens up, opens up a lot of vulnerabilities, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it'll be interesting to see how that plays in the CMMC space. I'm not seeing a CMMC be as much into the we don't need an office kind of mentality, but uh it, it 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 stands to reason that that's the direction many organizations are going. You need to be prepared for that. And it, you know, here's the thing: when once you get involved in the cloud, your complexity increases, uh, and so that's the thing where you have to be so much more careful because there's so many things that need to be thought of from a security and compliance standpoint that are just not natural. I mean, you can go out and just sign up for Office 365 and. Somebody might say, well, hey, it's you know compliant or they have a government compliant version, but did you get to the right version? Have you configured it to be actually secure? Because by default, it's not. Um, and you know, so maybe you're a HIPAA organization like, yeah, that supports HIPAA. But if you don't do the right things to set it up, which we find that many do not know how to do, uh, then you don't have any of those things in place. You just have the potential to have those things in place. And that's, I think, a, a critical point when it comes to not just Office 365, but any of the cloud services, you know, where you're storing files, maybe applications you're using. There's lots of new issues you have to look after. Uh, and, and even even more so if you're putting things, whether it's into the, you know, Gov, Cloud version of Amazon or the GCC or GCC high version of Azure, um, you know, there's all sorts of additional security things you need to do beyond just subscribing to the service from that version, uh, you know, of the government version, they are still not secure by default. That just means that U.S. citizens only have access to the physical devices with the data on it. And so it's just one of these things where a lot of people have misnomers uh, about this. It's not secure by default. It's just capable of it. And, and uh, you need to make sure you're working with a provider or an IT staff who is truly expert in the security of the cloud systems that promote and make work from home available for a secure and compliant organization. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's what I was going to say is this is when it's time to hire the professional, right? Yeah, it's it's something that I, I have yet to see people able to just kind of stumble across. It's not, um, it, it, look, we're just getting to a spot where people can easily provision their own Office 365 or their own Amazon something, even if they're not terribly technical. And that's, that's definitely what those organizations want to do. They want to make it easy. But the security side of it is more complex than on-premise. And the security side requires greater levels of expertise. And it is not something you can easily do even as a, an IT person who's done IT for years, if you're not specifically trained or capable and know how, you you don't know how to do this. You mm -hmm. know? Yep. Yep. Well, that was really, really good. Thank you, Carl. I'm glad we went over all that stuff and touched base on all this stuff that some people might not think of and some people may think is very obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So is there anything you want to throw out there before we go? No, no. Just remember physical security is part of it at every level and uh, get after it. Get those things done. If you have projects out there uh, to get it done, um, make it happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Carl, for your time and all your knowledge. We really appreciate that. Thanks, Dana. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope to see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Snapdeck IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC, education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com.